Hello, I'll be back with second season of the Talent Waste Show. And as most of you know from the first season, we're on a mission to find out if Talent Waste is for research, statistics, and brilliant guests each week on this very show, the Talent Waste Show. What is Talent Waste? Talent Waste affects organizations across all industries, and it occurs when an employee leaves an organization prematurely due to the business not being able to retain them. We've got some fantastic uh, knowledge from the first season. Between 30 and 45% of employees leave organizations within the first year, and over 80% of employee turnover is due to bad hiring decisions. During the series one, we spoke to industry leaders about their experience with talent waste and how they managed to navigate and deliver some excellent initiatives across their global businesses. We've had some fantastic guest lines up in this second series as well, and I cannot wait to share them with you. You can catch up with all of the shows by Crowdcast, by Spotify, on the audio side of things, but also on YouTube at Phoenix One, or check out, check out our LinkedIn page or phoenix51.io. But let's get to today, because I'm very, very happy and delighted to have a guest who has an undeniable passion for talent. Georgina has worked in talent acquisition for some of the biggest names in the recruitment industry and now is the Director of Talent Acquisition for Foxtons. Excited to have with us today, Georgina Lansdale. Georgina, welcome to the Talent Waste Show. How are you getting on? Thank you. It's really nice to be here. Yeah, very excited. No, absolutely fantastic. And Georgina, for some of the viewers and listeners that maybe don't know who you are as yet or uh, haven't been following you, who are you? Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, the, the phenomenal stuff that you've been doing at Foxton's. Um, so I'm Georgina Lansell. Um, I'm the Director of Talent Acquisition at Foxton's. I've been here just under four years now. Um, and since then, um, we have che completely changed our recruitment team, our talent acquisition department. Um, we had to move it initially in line with market changes. And then obviously with the last couple of years and everything that's happened there, we've continued to develop it and transform it. But we've, um, yeah, we've, we've changed so much. It's hard to know really where to start. But um, some, I guess some kind of top top highlight news would be bringing in experienced hires. So Foxton's typically, you know, in the past, if you left Foxton's, that was sort of the end of, of your career there. We've completely transformed that. So we've brought in an alumni program, but also, you know, experienced hiring from scratch. We did a huge EVP project to make sure that that all ran smoothly. Um, lots of work on our brand. Um, we've completely transformed assessment centers. I know we share lots of kind of similar beliefs in how we should attract um, and assess entry level talent in particular. And, and we've done a huge amount of of work there, um, loads of work with agencies and reducing spend and cost per highs. It's honestly, it's hard to know where to start, but it was no, been a big, so big four years. It's <laughs> brilliant. It's brilliant. I mean, like you say, just under four years. Let's let's start about um, uh, around that EP piece. I mean, I hear so much about kind of the, the the value proposition for employees and that you know the candidate experience and the candidate journey. And how typically because Foxtons are absolutely huge and you know during uh, I, mean, I suppose just take us back a little bit during the pandemic it, you would have thought in the industry that Foxtons are in it would have been very very hard but I know obviously mm -hmm. from speaking to and working with you previously that actually you you guys and, and girls carried on so what, what was the pandemic like and how did you get that kind of candidate experience or employee um, value proposition correct? Yeah, I think that's that's a really good question because I think the thing with EVP is that it, for me anyway, it's not set in stone forever. So it might be that as your company starts to change, your EVP starts to change. It might be that market conditions affect your EVP. You know, suddenly you can't offer something that you would have offered in the past. So I think your EVP has to be super flexible. Um, in terms of how we handled COVID, you're, you're completely right. You know, estate agents couldn't sell and let houses from from home. So where the rest of the world was kind of completely locked down. I think it was the second lockdown where estate agency started to open up again. Um, we yeah. were really clever with what we did with TA. Um, we looked after them very well. So obviously we were all furloughed, myself included, for um, a brief oh, period wow. of time. But um, we, we came back quite quick and we kind of unfurloughed everyone in a sort of a pattern to make sure that we were doing that in line with what the business needed us to do from a hiring okay. point of view. So yeah. it wasn't yeah. just one day TA was turned off and the next day it was turned back on again. It was very strategically done. So we were very clever in that sense and it meant that we were ahead of our competitors very quickly. Um, but back to candidate experience. Um, yeah, it was tough. It was really tough. We couldn't do assessment centres, which for us are the main kind of thing that we do to assess entry-level talent for Foxton's. So we had to change 
change the process. Our recruiters did more in-depth telephone interviews and our hiring managers, our area directors would meet the candidates face to face for a more in depth interview, still looking for competencies. So still very focused on um, making sure that we found the right people to do the roles rather than the right people from, you know, uni state. It was it was very focused on what we knew as a brand worked for us. Um, but it yeah. just had to be adapted because obviously we couldn't put, you know, 40 candidates in a room together. So, yeah, it's it's um, it was an interesting time considering it affected the way we recruit so heavily. I wish I wish we'd have known each other back then because one, one of the things that that Phoenix Fifty One does, of course, yeah. is virtual assessment centres. So we took yeah. that process and virtualised it. But that that is, of course, another story. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the assessment centre piece is really interesting, for, obviously for both of us. It's something that we both really believe in. What what do you feel the benefit of competency, behavioural, uh, not not just necessarily interviewing, but assessment is as, as well, Georgina. What has it done? What, what tangibles, I suppose, have you seen in your business by doing that recruitment in that way? Um, so many. It's hard to know where to start even with that. Um, so I think for me, everywhere I've worked, I've built in a piece that has involved the candidate getting to know the job as well as us getting to know the candidate. So for us, our assessment centre is split into three parts. And two of those parts especially involve tasks that are as closely related to being an estate agent as possible without actually being in one of our front offices. So I think firstly, um, assessment centres more than interviews, much more than interviews, can allow candidates um, a real insight into how how um, they might be you know, conducted day to day, how they might do their job, um, yeah. the, the challenging bits as well as the good bits. Um, secondly, I'd say for us um, area directors, which are our sort of main hiring managers um, and also the, the level below that who help us a huge amount in this process, don't even see a CV. They, they, you know, they might know the, they'll know the candidate's name because they'll have a sticker on with their name, um, which obviously yeah. helps us when assessing them, but they won't know anything about that candidate's background until the very end of the process. So it removes so much Love bias it. yeah so, so that for me um that's a really important part because it means that we're actually looking for people that we know um are hopefully um, going to be really effective at, at being able to do this role we're kind of ticking that ability box and at the end of the process they'll get to know them and i think lastly the only other thing i'd add there um is that we really analyzed what good looked like so i think one of the things that is so important when you're doing um hiring especially entry level you know when you're interviewing experienced candidates you've got loads to talk about with their cv and where they've been and what yeah. they've been doing and how, how similar that is to your environment but with um entry level you know they are, they're so different they're all they're all from completely different backgrounds so it's so much harder to make sure you find the right person so when we built these assessment centers very quickly we spoke to um, all of the decision makers to kind of talk to them about what entry level looked like in terms of success in their team so what that exact role what those people had competency wise and then yeah. we built the competencies um and the, the assessment center around those those things so we know that you know when we're going to know the recruiters will obviously have screened based on a cv um but that you know very minimal They'll, their main kind of priority in their telephone screen is to talk about why the candidate's interested in the role what they think it involves and why they think they'd be good at it and then they might ask them obvious things that you know a, an area director would want to know such as you've got a really big gap for 18 months can you talk me through what you did there but the the sort of three quarters of their telephone screen isn't even based on the cv at all at that stage it's so yeah for me, it's it's really important that we continue, you know, we're known for our, our diversity, um, really, really well known in the property industry for our diversity. So it's really important that we continue to do that and that we um, make sure that we're only kind of talking to people about their education right at the end of the process, for instance. I mean, uh, literally, it's like so. the viewers and listeners are going to think that I've, I've, I've cloned you out of, out of our playbook or something, but I promise you I haven't. <laughs> Mr. You know, speaking to Georgina um, over, it's been it's been a good few months now, isn't it? To be fair, but yeah. speaking to you and understanding what what your process and what you put in place and the initiatives you've done in Foxlands, it's just it, it's just so you know so much synergy to 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 what I believe and what our organisation believes as well. I'm very interested to talk to you about that. What good looks like piece because mm -hmm. for for me the whole point of the whole essence is understanding what the values and behaviours need to be in order to be able to find the right person, right? And that's why yeah. putting the CV to one side and actually hiring based on behaviours and competency is is really really important. You mentioned also yeah. about the tasks that are specific as, as close as you could be to the real life scenario of being a state agent you, you're almost describing the apprentice obviously that, that is <laughs> close to my heart and that's one of the things that i think is 
it does baffle me, Georgina, as, as organisations that like I meet so many different people that actually still organisations are not taking this type of approach. This is seen yeah. from the assessment perspective as gold standard. You know, my, my business partner, Chris Wimshurst, as you know, is a business psychologist, um, mm -hmm. you know, and a qualified psychometrician. And this type of approach, what's the outcome been? What's the kind of, not necessarily numbers and figures, but have you seen a huge improvement in the way that your the TA function is, is set up now and, and the output you've got with with employees, with uh, um, productivity, for example, for, with, with retention, as an example? Yeah. Yeah, I think for us, um, the, certainly the biggest, I think there's been so much over the last couple of years that has um, affected retention for a state agency in particular. I know every industry has been affected, but, you know, the, for us, you know, we can't offer hybrid working. You know, there's so much that's happened that has meant yeah. that perhaps people have left that wouldn't have ordinarily left if it wasn't for COVID. So we've had to, you know, as we spoke about more towards the beginning, continue to adapt even what we offer. So the way we look at retention is twofold, you know, continuing to look at what we offer and and it's, is that still at the forefront of the market? And are we adapting that with yeah. the times that we're in? And also continuing to look at what we assess and making sure we're finding the right people for the business that we have today and building pipeline for the future. So I think yeah, there's been so many things that have happened that have affected retention and also have meant that we continue to look at retention. You know, retention is obviously crucial in a TA function. But the, the biggest kind of immediate um rise that we got from from doing assessment centers as opposed to the old way of recruiting kind of pre pre me and pre sarah at, at foxton's um was just the ability to first off give candidates a much better experience so the fact that they got to kind of come in and see our shiny headquarters and actually get to like we said before experience the role meet meet quite a few different people in the business because obviously you know assessment centers you're, you're not you know we don't want them to be assessed by one assessor to again to help with bias we want them to meet multiple people um cool. but also it meant that we could um scale up much quicker um than we than we ever could before so you know where where we were relying heavily on agencies to help plug gaps um it just meant that ta was so much more flexible we could um interview lots of candidates in the same you know the same way we weren't doing anything for one candidate we weren't doing for another um but also meant that we could improve our numbers you know much quicker so we could make sure that from a business point of view we were really fulfilling what was needed it's a, it's a great point, isn't it? You know, all them businesses out there that are scaling up, you know, we we talk, so, we hear these phrases so many times, don't we, Georgina, about the war on talent and, you know, yeah. it's not just specific to your industry or, you know, or yeah. to a specific sector. This is everywhere. Like if you're looking for predominantly in Foxons, maybe you're looking for, you know, sales, uh, you know, sales uh, bias uh, um, uh, individuals, you know, the, the war for sales individuals everywhere. I mean, Phoenix 51 are recruiting SaaS salespeople today, right now. And and yeah. it's tough, it's really hard out there. Some of the, the, the clients that we know that we, we've uh, in, um, implemented Phoenix into, they're always looking. So, you know, that, that war on talent is, is really important. So getting that experience right for the candidates, for essentially your employees, that retention piece, what what I struggle to, to, to still understand, which is why we're still on our mission for, for talent waste, is that, you know, often national statistics states, as I said at the beginning, 30 to 45 percent leaving in year one. That just means it's a repeatable cycle. Yeah. It's quite, quite tough to get, you know, as the director of talent acquisition, all of a sudden you've made, I don't know, you've scaled by, I don't know, say 50, but you know, all of a sudden 15 of them have left. You've got to yeah. replace them again. Like, that's quite tough, isn't it? You know, do, do you think yeah. that? the processes the initiatives that you put into place is, is really start to curb that retention oh uh, sorry that attrition yeah yeah absolutely i mean certainly compared to what we were doing we are in a much much better place um you know this is again kind of pre four years ago what yeah. we've done since then is has definitely put us in a better place i also think bringing in experienced hiring has helped hugely with that so for okay. us you know we're we're a very organic growth model. We always have been, we always will be, you know, we're very well known for kind of putting lots of people into the industry and, other, you know, lots of CEOs, our competitors started their career or certainly worked for a huge part of their career at Foxton. So we're really well known for our, our training and our development of our staff. Um, and, and typically, I think like we touched on earlier, when you left Foxton's, you know, more than four years ago, you, you never came back. The door was almost shut. And that was sort of done on purpose. You know, we we wanted to promote from within. We wanted to promote that we promoted from within. And, and that was the, the, the thing that we were really well known for. Now, as, as companies get bigger, obviously, you don't always have the right person to promote. And that led to us at times, you know, maybe not having a great manager in, in a role where... 
we're from very similar backgrounds in that you know recruitment the recruitment industry the agency industry is very similar to the estate agency industry and you'd often have people who are amazing recruiters but weren't great managers but they'd get the manager spot because they'd been there the, you know the longest or they were the most experienced or or yeah. whatever and actually half the time they didn't even want it they wanted to carry they don't on want it. they don't want them yeah. to lose money essentially don't they we've all been there in a sense of when you go from kind of the you know the you know the south senior consultant level or something to, to team leader manager you think hang on I, I, I'm not getting as much money as I was before. Where's my commission gone? Yeah. Type thing? It's totally. a tough transition, isn't it? Totally. So I think one of the first things um, that I did, I think probably six months into my time at Foxton's was bring um, a girl called Sophie in to work for my my team. Um, and we just together completely transformed experienced hires. So, um, you know, we have, went on a huge culture shift as a business. Um, we also started the alumni program. So we would print out sheets and sheets of paper um, and go through it with the, you know, sit down with area directors and say, these are the people that you lost in the last five years. Who would you hire again? And then make kind of, you know, Know, make action plans to to go out and, and grab them and hopefully bring them back which lots have returned so i think Amazing. one of the things that has helped us too with retention is to um not just continue with that organic growth model actually to to take the business on a journey where it's good to hire it from exp you know experienced members of staff whether they're xboxers or whether they're just um other great people in our industry it's great to bring them in and we've really you know the last couple of years in particular we've had some fantastic people um join us that have really transformed departments so you know pre me coming in and i was they, very they huge to hire. did they work for you before some of them did, some of them didn't. Probably a, around a fifth of her hires are probably alumni. Wow. Um, so, wow. you know, a huge amount that aren't. Um, but still, you know, Sophie on average probably hires around five people a month. So now, and that will be all over the business. You know, it's not just yeah. on the estate agency side. You'll work on marketing roles, you know, at all, all different departments. So yeah, it's, it's so, all yeah. yeah, it's great that now we have another source of, of people that we can use. You know, we, we don't have to just find someone to plug that gap. And that's helped hugely with retention. That's amazing. Uh, we've got to go to a break, but before we do, I just I just want to probe into that if I can a little bit. I, I find that really interesting. I think that probably since I might be wrong here, so let, let's uh, let's ask you actually because that's why you're here. But <laughs> probably since COVID, the alumni piece started to gain traction. I didn't really hear about alumni stuff that much before in the industry, but now I do. It's come up quite a lot. I'm quite interested in this because. I, I started my, I suppose I started my recruitment career at Hayes, but then I went on to Capita and I spent nearly uh, eight and a half years at Capita, ended up running mm -hmm. a big uh, uh, multi-million pound division for them. And loads of people used to leave Capita and then come back, leave Capita. And it used to be an in-joke because Capita was so difficult to leave. And that's changed a lot nowadays. I'm going back a few years. But is is that quite, I suppose, normal now? Like 20% of the people that Sophie hires is, is alumni. That's, I think that's fantastic. Yeah, I think um, for us, we started working on the alumni program probably about three and a half years ago. So it's hard to okay. it's hard to say. I, I think with you know your comments in terms of has it has it just kind of started peaking in the last couple of years. Um, I, I maybe we were ahead of the curve with that. I don't know. Um, but I think for us, we knew that you know Foxton's where it was ten years ago compared to where it is now is a very different business as a lot of the property industry is so we knew we had bits that we could play on that meant that it was easy to bring or easier to bring people back than it would have been you know back then so you know things like for instance the hours are nowhere near as long we've done loads of work on our family packages in terms of what you're paid when you have you know kids and how, how well you're supported in terms of that um so we've we've done loads of work on you know everything from cars to salaries to hours you know all, loads of different bits so we knew what the types of reasons people would leave in the past because te you know everyone does tend to look back on their time at Foxton's really really fondly you know there's a real right. joke about bleeding green and yellow and you know everyone everyone loves their their time at Foxton's but you know 10 years ago there were things that meant that people just had to leave if they chose to you know perhaps they wanted to be at home a bit more with a family or you know they didn't want to work yeah. till late Four nights a week whereas we've, we've the changed weekend. that so, yeah the weekend I mean, is is really it, big yeah does, does that still i mean that's a generalization from me so forgive me but yeah do, do, do they still work, have to work weekends like saturdays or even sundays and that type of stuff 
yes, they don't work Sundays, thank goodness. Um, so they, they do work Saturdays at entry level. Um, at, the, at the start of their careers, they work every other, I think it's 10 till four. It tends to be um, a day where you do second viewing. So it tends to be a bit more of an exciting day. Um, yeah, well, right and about. Off the back of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then they, they lose Saturdays, the more experience they get. So we've changed that as well. So you know, the more tenure you have in the business, the less Saturdays you do, all the way up to doing none. Brilliant stuff. Georgina, you're absolutely phenomenal. Um, I'm going to go for, for our uh, break of the show. And then when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about bias. So I want to talk to you about that. You mentioned that earlier. Um, we're going to talk about, we're going to grill Georgina a little bit on her best hire and her worst hire. See if we can get some stuff out of there. And I also want to talk about being a mum. Because Georgina is not only a phenomenal talent acquisition director, but she's also a mum. We'll be back after this. Phoenix 51 is a powerful employee technology enabling organizations to make data-driven decisions at every stage of the employee journey from hiring through benchmarking and development too. The platform provides detailed analytics on the most important asset in your business, your people, enabling organizations not only to make the correct hiring decisions, but also how to benchmark, train and retain them. Phoenix 51 powering your people decisions through every part of the employee journey. Okay, so we are back over the other side of the adverts. We've, uh, I think we've got a little couple as well coming our way. So that's, uh, hopefully that's going to be the case. So Georgina, um, before the break, we touched upon um, some really good stuff, some EVP. Uh, we talked about the, the importance of the candidate experience during that, uh, around that process. Alumni as well, which I, I find absolutely fascinating. You know, we really uh, talked about the assessment and the power of early careers, competencies, behaviours, that, that kind of attention that you've seen, the process um, being rolled out in, in Fox and since, since you've been there. Um, you mentioned during that period around bias, and, and this is something I want to pick up. This is such a hot topic, um, mm -hmm. and, and rightly so. Um, and I think this is certainly something that has started to come to the forefront of, of all of our minds probably over the last kind of five years. It's always been there. I mean, I started a business, a, a recruitment company called Raw Talent, banging on about <laughs> ripping up the CV and not worrying about people's you know, gender and behaviours, uh, you know, and focusing on their behaviours and stuff. And that was like 10 years ago. But... But, you know, now it's very, very prominent. You mentioned in the assessment um, process that because you have multiple assessors, mm. they start to cut down that bias piece. Just mm -hmm. talk to us, and, and obviously the views and the listeners, this is really important. There'll be a lot of people out there watching and listening thinking, how do I start to combat, you know, if I've got hiring managers that have been here for 10 years, 15 years, I know how to hire, yeah. I know what I'm doing. How do we kind of combat that? And, and, and what have you seen work? How long have you got? Um, I think that's a re that's a really big challenge. Like that's one of the most challenging things I think about joining a new organisation is getting to know your hiring managers and if they have. I mean, everyone has bias, so we should we should say every you know it, it, in some way, shape, or form, um, they're going to have things that stick out for them as being you know important when. Are they important? I mean, we, for instance, you know, are kind of I hope Fox and State mind me sharing a good one that we used to have, but um, we used to hate people in brown shoes. I mean, that's definitely not me included. But if someone came to an interview in brown shoes, that would be something that would get mentioned throughout the whole of their interview process. And it was madness. You know, brown shoes don't right. predict whether someone's going to be successful or not. And, and obviously, if they were that important and, you know, dress codes and all of that aside, but you could ask someone to change their shoes. It's madness. So, you know, um, I think, yeah, it's, it's a really Really tricky question because it's hard to know exactly where to start I think for us some of the bits that we've done um, are to make sure that our processes you know have things like multiple assessors so that um, it, that's without the assessor even having to do anything you know that we're, we're building a process that means that for the candidate hopefully there is less bias because they are being seen by at least three different people throughout the process and then hopefully interviewed by someone else entirely again at the end so that's a big one so processes yeah. would be a big one just to interact with you on that, I mean, again, that's that's really important for the viewers and the listeners as well if you're thinking about this, because you know, it, it might be that you start to see, and you can definitely you can do this through our platform, for example, but you can start to see patterns emerge. You know, if I keep yeah. high, if I keep scoring very low when all of my peer group are scoring, you know, much higher, you know, four or five different people, but it's only me then there's going to be some sort of unconscious bias there with me. So it gives us an opportunity to be able to then say, okay. 
let's have a conversation. Is there anything that we need to do in front from a training perspective, from a scoring point of view, yeah. to make sure that we can mitigate? You know, I think the key thing is, I think we both know that you can't eradicate unconscious bias. It's, it's about mitigating it. What yeah. can we do the best thing? And that, that policy around multiple um, assessors or multiple interviews is really, really important, I think. Yeah, really important. Um, a couple of other bits. So, um, in terms of making sure that when you do your interview coaching as well, you're not so you're not just focusing on the assessment centre part. You're also looking at interview coaching and kind of you know we call it charmingly challenge, but hopefully charmingly challenge your peers and your you know your hiring managers to make sure that if they're you know after the interview kind of debriefing with you, talking you through bits that you don't believe in. Um, I think it's it's your job as a TA specialist to make sure that you continue to push them to be a better interviewer. If, you, if they were great interviewers and they had a brilliant hiring model, you wouldn't be there. So I think you, you owe it, to, you owe it to your department and to yourself to kind of continue to push the business forwards in, in things like this. And obviously unconscious bias training, you know, we regularly run sessions. Everyone who becomes an assessor for the first time goes through um, a, a good chunk of training to make sure they know what they're doing, they, they know what the assessment center looks like, they know, you know, typical signs of unconscious bias they we've certainly gone through at least the basics before they're in there on day one and they'll get kind of wrapped up in the next session that we do um, in more thorough detail as well so I think you know running unconscious bias training sessions is really important but don't just don't forget that it's also the interview stage you know doing interview coaching can be really really important um, and the process bit that we mentioned at the beginning I also yeah. think data can be um, really important here so for instance you know we used to put referrals on a pedestal when I got here if someone was a referral they must be an amazing candidate you know especially ones that were related to great people I mean they were basically in wow. the door I mean, they, they are, the the <laughs> yeah I mean I am so similar to my sister really 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 so very different in some ways but really similar that doesn't mean that she would be brilliant at TA and it doesn't mean that I would be brilliant in her uh, you know in her career so I think that you know just proving that there were referrals that you know dropped out more than others at the beginning was a really valuable thing for us to do because it, it suddenly kind of brought light to the fact that you know just because someone was a referral didn't mean that um, they were a better hire so I think sometimes using data as well if you've got a big trend of something happening but actually it then doesn't work out that can be really powerful I, I mean obviously, obviously I, I run a data platform that, that does exactly this so I'm completely biased if you like on on, on that but no I, I mean jokes aside I completely agree with you I think that one of the things this I mean I've got identical twin girls they're identical, yeah. but you know, uh, by by birth. But I'm telling you, they are completely different people. Yeah. You know, they're, they're nine now, nine years old, Lottie and Lois. And you wouldn't put them just because they're ident biologically identical. You wouldn't put them in the same job because they wouldn't be able to do it. And that yeah. proves that you were just making completely, um, uh, you know, uh, com completely does. So I think the other key thing as well I, I like about that is we talked about data and talked about trends. Is how how are we challenging? if there are some trends and that's again that's quite important if you've got some data that we've taken down in real time when we're observing watching looking assessing what we've got the talent that we've got in front of us it can only be a much fairer process and therefore when we're challenging it doesn't become well it's my opinion and i'm the boss and i'm taking that person on it becomes yeah. an objective um uh, a discussion or debate or yeah. watch up session however you want to phrase it yeah. an assessment whereby you're saying well hang on during that period this is what you said this is this is what you said this is what you observed now you're changing your mind because maybe your boss is is trying to change your mind or yeah it's, it's, so it's really looking and showing everybody that actually the data points your observational assessments that you know that the interview process that we've got against our core values is is there and actually regardless of if you're male or if you're female if you're from a um, you know a, a different ethnicity you know if you've got a degree you haven't got a degree which is my you know the soapbox i get on it's actually irrelevant if you're scoring really high and you're showing that you've got the display you've got the behaviors you've got the competencies to work in that role that's what should give get you the opportunity do you agree absolutely yeah i mean even in the last year we've hired bus drivers bingo callers oh you know alarm salesmen yeah and and all of them doing entry-level roles and obviously yeah. have all passed you know really rigorous criteria to, to get a role at Foxton's but ultimately you know the going back to that point on diversity I think it's really important that you continue to attract a really wide range of people that um yeah. you know can, can continue to um to make sure that we're a really diverse workforce and that we're doing the right thing so yeah no, no. Uh, yeah totally agree
completely agree. No, completely it's fascinating stuff. Now we talked before um before we wanted to break it, I talked about you um being a mum. Um and yeah. we're talking about my children and all that sort of stuff. So you are a mum, Georgina. So yeah. you know, you've so far had a phenomenal career. How do you I don't want to say how do you juggle everything because that's such such a you know a, a, a you know a, a, an obvious question, but how has it been for you being a you know a, a, a mum and also having a high powered job as, as to what you've actually got at the moment? So how, how does that how do you fit it all in? Um, I think my husband probably deserves a shout out here. I don't know how I'd do it without him. Um, yeah, so yeah, some some kind of pushing stereotypes going on in our family, certainly to a certain extent. Um, I think it's really tough. It's really tough. I've got a toddler at the moment, about just over six weeks away from number two, um, and I think. For me, working somewhere where you re really believe in what you're doing and you're really passionate about your job and you love the brand and you want to do well for them is is key. So I couldn't I yeah. couldn't work what I do in for Foxtons. You know, I couldn't do the the kind of the days that I do. I do a full time job. I haven't got reduced hours at all, and I couldn't I couldn't do that for a brand that I didn't believe in. And I just I think I'd constantly feel like I was missing out on time with my toddler. So I think yeah, first off, I've got an amazing husband that does basically every nursery drop off and pick up, um, which is a huge help. But secondly, um, I'm completely off my own back. I've chosen to to continue to work in a in a really you know a job that is demanding um, because I really believe in the brand. You know, I, I I could have done less hours when I came back. I was hugely supported on maternity leave um, the first time around, and I am being you know for the build up to number two. So you know, Foxtons could not have been better in, on that side. Um, but ultimately, it just comes down to the fact that I really really want to be here. And when I'm at home, I make the most of my you know home time, and I really really focus on my my toddler and my family. But um, um, yeah, being being at work, I, I just get to focus on work, and that's what I'm really passionate about from a career point of view. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> oh, it's amazing! Oh, it's amazing! Uh, you know, uh, do, do you get to switch off? I mean, it's it's amazing. <laughs> it's so difficult, isn't it? It's amazing that you've got um, such a good family unit around you, your husband, yeah. and that type of stuff. So big shout out to Georgina's husband. Um, you know, I, I, I'm in your I'm in his boots as well. To be fair, I do yeah. a lot of small ones and whatever. So it's quite interesting. But you. you you are you have a massive belief in, in foxes you've got the passion and desire you can see that you know, do, mm. do you ever get a chance to switch off knowing that you know you've got these huge projects that you're running the evp project you talked about before okay. the you know the um the pivoting when covid hit and having to change the, you know the entire assessment process do you ever get a chance to you know to switch off and you know, what, what does georgina do outside of work um, yeah, good question. I think at the moment it's hard to switch off because I'm so close to going on maternity leave again. So there's quite a few bits that I'm keen to kind of get over the line before I go. So at the moment yeah. it's very hard to switch off. Um, but in general, yes. I mean, I obviously don't work weekends, so um, I have, you know, loads of time there and I, I do at least one day a week from home, which is great. I get to do bed and bath and breakfast then too, which is really fun um, with our, our little one. But yeah, no, absolutely. I play, I still go to the gym. I was in the gym at, you know, seven o'clock this morning. So I go to the gym most oh, days. Cool, That's my like cool. big, big kind of switch off time. I love, you know, having nothing else to think about and just working out. So yeah, do that most days, still play a bit of hockey, see friends and stuff. You know, we're really lucky. We've got some great mates around us that are in a similar position with kids. So, you know, we, we kind of know what to expect from each other and, and things like that. So yeah, definitely, definitely get to switch off, but I think probably less so than maybe some of my other jobs in the past but that's okay i'm i'm someone that's got to be moving and got to be you know got to have something going on all the time so i'm i'm, I'm okay with it you, you can feel that actually your energy you need to have your energy <laughs> so that's really amazing um you talked earlier about um you know you believe in foxtons and you believe in what you're doing and you love what you're doing and you know you can feel and hear the passion H how do you, how do you get like that you know not not from a leader perspective, but just from a you know from a you perspective for our viewers and listeners out there. Like, how do you become so passionate about the role that you're doing? Like, is it is it something that is it because your values and your your uh, beliefs are mirrored with the with the employer? Mm -hmm. and yeah. With, it's like talk to us a little bit about that. 
Yeah, I think that's a it's a good question. I don't know entirely where it's come from. I can think of people that I hired, you know, earlier on in my career that really made me believe in this as an industry. You know, I remember a guy that I hired in my first job working for Hydrogen Group, probably a year into that that role. He came up to me and he said, I've just bought an Audi uh, TT outright. And it's all because of you. You know, you put me in this job and I love what I'm doing. And he was um, he was a recruiter for pharmaceuticals. And he just, you know, th things like that happening or, you know, placing two people that got married that you know never would have met if it, if it hadn't been that I picked up the phone that day and called them you know Amazing. things like that happened early on that I think kind of really started to ignite that sort of passion for hang on a minute this isn't about making good money because you know recruitment in general is good money it's actually it's more than that it's about finding the right people for the you know for the right company at the right time and building the pipeline for that company moving forward so I think there were a few things that probably happened early on that made me think actually um, you know I am driven by being ambitious and career oriented and I wanted to go and go on and do great things and earn good money but also there's it's more to it that I want to make sure that I am finding the right people it's not a bums on seats job for me it's a what do we need and how do we build a process that accurately finds that to find the right person that's going to genuinely enjoy their career here so I think I yeah that. probably some, some bits from early on you know early days that built up but yeah a bit like I said to you earlier I've never worked for a brand that I didn't believe in so I think getting to know the brand when you're um, interviewing and you're you know doing your research and stuff is hugely important and making sure that um, you are working with ultimately people that are going to you know believe in what you believe in one of the brilliant things about my first year and has you know continued to be at Foxton's was that um, it's very unusual for companies um, to kind of put their hands up and say I know how to, you know I know nothing really about hiring I've, you, I've hired you for a reason come yeah. in change what you want there's no as Sarah used to say there's no sacred cows or you know there's nothing there that you can't change just do what you want. We need your help. And um, for me, Foxton's of all of, you know, the places that I've worked at so far was the biggest company that did that. They were the ones that were like, you know, do what you want. So I think it's that's really refreshing when you because then it going back to that kind of charmingly challenging piece. It's, it yeah. makes those types of conversations so much easier because they actually want your help. So, um, yeah, I think working with brands that you believe in and people that um, are really aligned with what you want to do is really, really important. But, yeah, I can't forget I the bit that. at the beginning, for sure. I love Yeah, I, I love that, that you you were always like a Tinder before, before it even existed, getting people jobs that are going to get married together. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that wasn't my intention, but just a lucky, a lucky result, I guess. But, well, yeah, I, it's I amazing, mean, isn't it, what happened? Yeah. I mean, it, it just goes back to what we we're saying before. If you if you can understand what good looks like and you get the right values and and, uh, and behaviours correct, yeah, you're, you're making people get, <laughs> spend the rest of their lives together. So you know you've got to be doing the same right for sure. So yeah, that, that's hugely important. Hugely important. Now you mentioned um, uh, br briefly earlier as well about kind of people that you've hired and and and, and so on yeah. and so forth. So I just want to uh, probe you a little bit if I can in terms of. A, maybe your best ever hire I mean don't have to name them for example but just give us a you know is there a story around how you how you found this superstar and he or she went on yeah. to do something amazing like, have you got any stories like that yeah I've got definitely a couple that spring to mind it's hard to know which one to talk about I think hiring Sophie for my team was undoubtedly one of the best things I ever did as a, as a hiring manager as well as a you know recruiter for, for Foxton's um, yeah. because she and I are just so aligned in terms of what we want to achieve and um, we're a really really good unit and, and you know Sophie allows us to like we said before completely transform the way we look at promotions and who we're hiring and putting into those really really important spots so I'd say Sophie um, from like a I guess a personal point of view as well because we work together every day is was a really crucial hire the, the and how, and just, quickly, just sorry just to interact with you there on on so on sophie where did she come from like how did you find her like was it was it a kind of a traditional thing or was it like you well, know you met sophie, her in the pub or whatever yeah sophie's actually a really interesting one in, in terms of process because she used to work for foxton's as a negotiator so she's almost okay. She's almost the perfect person to look after experience hires because she did, I think, around four or so years as a negotiator. She then yeah. moved out to uh, Dubai and worked on the recruitment side looking for negotiators. So she had experience. She also did a short oh, stint in agency. Yeah. So she'd kind of seen the, the full picture. Um, so she wasn't just because I don't necessarily believe that just because you're a good negotiator, you'll be a good recruiter because you you know the job. I think there's, you know, again, you need to work out what you're looking for to be a good recruiter and kind of go back from there. But for Soph, she had done, she'd been a neg 
Meg. She'd been an agency recruiter and she'd been an internal recruiter looking for negotiators. So she was the perfect mix. And we knew that she was back in the UK and kind of looking for jobs just again because of kind of keeping in touch with alumni and things like that. Um, and we tried to uh, we tried to pinch her back and get her to come and work for us. And she actually declined us first time around. She went no to work way. for a tech so company. Young. <laughs> yeah, she went to work for a tech company. And three months later, three months of me kind of knocking on her door, being like, are you sure? Are you sure? And finally, she was like, right, I've got to do it. I've got to come back to Foxton's. Again, just basically because of the brand. She just okay. looked back on her time so fondly, um, really loved what Sarah and I were doing at the time at Foxton's. And luckily, we managed to get her back. And now I think hopefully she'll be with me for good. But um, yeah, she's Maybe. she's definitely I'll one that I think down. from a personal point of view was a great hire. No, fantastic. And uh, sorry, I interrupted you as well. You've got to go yeah. on to one other key, key story. Have you got another one? Yeah, well, probably my my biggest um, hire to date would have been at, at um, re really, really senior level for us um, just before I went on, on maternity leave last time, actually. And he was a year from, from doing the initial market map um, for what we needed um, at the time to him walking through the door was a year. And um, right. I think at one point he even said, you know, you can put an offer in front of me, but I'm I'm not going to accept it. And I was just like, I couldn't talk to anyone about it because it was a it was a confidential role for Foxton's. It was just my poor husband every night that would get the latest kind of stint of what would happen to try and woo this guy um, into yeah. joining us. And so it went on, you know, it went on for a really long time. Um, and then, you know, him kind of starting and just such a triumph for Foxton's. I mean, he's done fantastic things. And without him, you know, there'd be a big part of our business missing as it is today. So I think that one's probably my, um, the, the, the one that gave me the most satisfaction to get over the line um, because yeah. you know it's so nice to do something for the company you work for that makes a huge difference but also it was just such a challenge because he was so happy where he was and he was a real yeah he was a real challenge to get to come to the other um, side so that's probably the one yeah that, I mean that is absolutely fantastic and the, and the work that you've done to get him over the line and, and Sophie as well I think he's been a bit modest with Sophie as well you know it wasn't just <laughs> luck. it was it was your perseverance and desire and your passion I bet anybody that, that talks um, talks, uh, uh, um, you know, fondly about you. Will talk about you in in a sense of that passion, that desire. I mean, it's just it's just brilliant to to see in in spades coming through from from you know you're clearly passionate about Foxons, and it's been an absolute yeah. pleasure, Georgina. Um, that's it. It wasn't too bad, was it? it didn't grow oh, you too no, much. It was, it was uh, yeah, that's it. I mean, it's been an absolutely fascinating show. Uh, we are, um, uh, you know. Like I said right at the beginning, we are on a mission around talent waste. But just before before I let you go, do, do you think that talent waste in the way that I've described it, and, and obviously this is the talent waste show, do you think it does exist? I mean, you've done a huge amount of Foxins for it not to, but do you think yeah. it does exist? And, you know, in your experiences just outside of Foxins as well in, in your career, ha have you seen that that, that that people will, businesses will hire and then, were, you know, rinse and repeat in that year one? It, it costs a huge amount of resource and time and lots of money now, actually, as well. Like, have you seen them patterns uh, uh, emerging? And, and is that one of the reasons why you've you've done what you've done at Foxons? Yeah, absolutely. I think anyone who works in the TA industry, that says, or really any business that says there isn't talent waste, I think is fibbing, personally. I think it, why we wouldn't be needed if there was no talent waste. If companies operated perfectly, they always found the right people, you know, they stayed for you know, even five years and then they moved on, we wouldn't be needed as TA professionals. So, yeah, no, absolutely. I think there is, um, you know, there is a, a problem, you know, UK wide, probably worldwide with, yeah. with talent waste. And I think it's up to us to continue to try to improve processes, experiences, you know, what we're offering, EVPs, brand, all of that. I think it's that that's our job. And that's why we're here to continue to improve everything so that hopefully we can reduce that talent waste. I completely agree. I mean, just just finally, finally, we, we are madly moving into 2023 in just a few weeks' yeah. time. Yeah. Completely crazy. You know, we we've, we've spoken to a lot of people like yourself and, and your peer group. What what do you think the biggest challenge in 2023 will be? If you could just kind of name maybe one or two like headlines, what do you think the yeah. the talent acquisition um, will will find the biggest challenge in 23? I think 2023 could be a really interesting and challenging EFTA. I think we're going to continue to see companies tightening their belts. So I think we'll see salaries kind of continuing to stabilise and jobs, job numbers possibly continuing to kind of drop off a bit. Um, but I also think we're going to see candidates being a bit, you know, playing it a bit more safe. I think people won't want to be that 
kind of last one in, first one out type person. So I think it could be, you know, I think there'd be a lot of pressure because there's going to be pressure on companies to perform, which means there'll be pressure on TA to find the right people for the right roles. Um, but I think that it could be really challenging. I think we might, you know, there might be situations where you've got reduced budget or resource or whatever, and you've still got to find the right people, but the right people maybe don't want to move. So I think the, the economy as a whole, um, it always affects TA, um, you know, wh whichever way it goes, it affects TA negatively or positively. So I think next year could be really challenging and interesting for TA, for sure. It'll be interesting right. to see what happens. Interesting views. Georgina, you've been absolutely brilliant. Just to let the viewers and listeners find, uh, you know, where can they find you? They follow you on LinkedIn, you know, if they want to get involved, yeah. find more information about Foxtons, well, where can they find yeah. you? Yeah, so we've we've still got loads of jobs at Foxton's. If anyone is interested in finding out a bit more about that, we'd love to hear from you. But I also am super passionate about networking. So please do add me on LinkedIn. I'd love to, you know, possibly not for the next couple of months. I think I have a lot on my plate. But after that, I'd love to meet for coffees and things like that with anyone who's who's kind of similarly as passionate as I am. So, yeah, no, please do find me on LinkedIn. Drop me a message and um, get in touch through Foxton's to um, yeah, keen to keen to meet more. Fantastic. The phenomenal, wonderful Georgina Lansdowne. Thank you so much. Best of luck Thank with you. uh, with, your, with your with your second as well. And I know that we're going to be in, in touch and we'll get you back on in the future as well um, to talk more talent waste. Well, that's it. I mean, the first episode of the second series is done. You can catch up with all of this episode and everything on the first uh, season as well on our YouTube channel at phoenix51.io and, of course, through Spotify and Crowdcast. Uh, and the likes on all, all of the audios. You can also uh, hook us up on LinkedIn as well. Same with Georgina as well. Georgina, you've been absolutely brilliant. And this has been Series 2 of the Talent Way Show. <laughs>